Hello, welcome to another edition of What the Papers Are Saying. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, in a bit, I'll tell you the big stories for the week, what the various media outlets published that made um, headlines this week. I also introduce to you my guests for today. Stay with us, don't go away. So let me give you an idea what the big stories you have been discussing at home are based on the um, stories the newspapers publish, the big ones, of course. Let's start with one of the biggest topics this week, sex for grades, and go to City Newsroom, which um, says USAC takes on university authorities after BBC's sexual misconduct expose. Same City Newsroom says, committee probing sex for grades to start work next week. This is coming from Audrey Gajekpo. Let's go to the Ghanaian Observer. Says, sex for grades scandal. UG interdicts Professor Jampo and Butako. Chronicle goes this way. BBC fires blank. Ghanaians say sex for grades expose is a wasted effort. Legon interdicts Jampo one other say on oh, those two stories um on the same newspaper city newsroom again sex for great scandal my interdiction was fair this is coming from professor jampo one of the lecturers uh, interdicted in the matter finder says two legon lecturers suspended over sexual harassment accusation that's how the finder captured that story Let's go to the informer. It says, Sex for Grades documentary. UG rubbishes BBC. Describes it as bogus piece of work. City Newsroom, again, Ghanaians behaving like ostriches in Sex for Grades saga. This is Professor Akosia Domanko speaking there. And 24 News says, Consequence of Sex Escapades. Varsity dons run for cover over sex for grade video. Let's go to the new crusading guide and see how they reported the story. They say, sex for grade saga, Professor Jampo Butako asks to step aside as UG begins probe. The Chronicle says, and Jampo wept, threatens to sue BBC over sex for grade expose. And finally, let's go to the Ghanaian Times, if we can. It says, Sex for Great Saga, UG interdicts Professor Jampo, Jampo and Dr. Butako. Let's move to another story that made headlines this week, has to do with the law students who went on demonstration. And let's start with the city newsroom and see how they captured it. Protesters dare police to provide evidence of misconduct during law students' demo. That's from City Newsroom. Same website says, withdraw illegal entrance exams undertaken. Law students to Nanado. Let's go to the finder. And it says, brute police crash an arm protesting law students. Rubber bullets, water cannons and leashed. Now, City Newsroom again says, Pusa condemns brutality against law students, demands probe from IGP. Let's stay with City Newsroom because it has another story on the condemnations. This is from the NYA this time, and it blasts police for brutalizing protesting law students. Let's go to the Ghanaian Times. Uh, says, demo against restricted legal education regime. Police law students clash. Two injured, 13 arrests. Let's go back to the city newsroom. Two other stories from them on the matter. And it says, police brutality against law students, totally unacceptable. This is coming from government, specifically the Minister of, of Information. Still with city newsroom, it says, MPP condemns police brutality on law students, calls for probe. Then let's move to the third story, which also made headlines this week, has to do with some former um, managing directors of defunct Capital Bank. Uh, uh, government has taken some um, 
made some movement with regards to that um, defunct bank and the former director. So let's go to City Newsroom and see how they captured that story. It says, Capital Bank collapsed at two ACN others charged with stealing and money laundering. Let's go to the Daily Guide. Short and simple says, at two ACN charged. Ghanaian Times says, at two ACN, three others charged over Capital Bank collapse. We go to ABC News and it says um, collapse of Capital Bank are two ACN others charged for stealing money laundering. Chronicle Capital Bank top officials charged with stealing money laundering. The new crusading guy says Capital Bank Bruhaha are two ACN others charged with stealing and money laundering. Business Finder says collapse of Capital Bank are two ACN three others charged accused of stealing abetment and money laundering. And the final newspaper, that's the Daily Graphic, says are two ACN three others on trial for Capital Bank collapse. So those are the top three stories that made headlines this week on uh, various um, platforms. Um, across the country. Let me bring in my two guests for tonight uh, and then we we'll start discussions around these interesting topics for this week. Um, let me introduce Selom Adonu. He's the um, head of, re um, head of um, features. Art features and articles here at City FM and City TV and our very own Samo Atamensa. He's now the um, <laughs> host of Footprints. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting guest he has on that show. Uh, Samuel Atta Mensah uh, with City TV and City FM. Gentlemen, welcome to um, what the papers are saying. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting topics this week. Let's start with the sex for greater. Let me quickly read what the Chronicle has because I feel it's very interesting. It says, BBC fires blank. Ghanaian say sex for grace expose is a wasted effort. Let me quickly go through that story. Barely 48 hours after the premiere of the much publicized Sex for Grace documentary by the BBC, which implicated two University of Ghana uh, Legon lecturers, some Ghanaians believe the expose was not worth the headline. Now, social media went agog with comments condemning the undercover piece, which was to expose sexual harassment in tertiary institutions in West Africa. Since the broadcast, comments indicate the investigative team could have done more to establish the facts of the documentary as captured in the title Sex for Grades. Among those who hold this school of thought is investigative journalist Manasa Azuria Wuni, who argue that the BBC Africa Eye expose ought to be rejected because it did not focus on how undeserved grades were offered to female students in exchange for sex. And it goes on and on and on. So, Samens, do you agree that we should reject the work they've done? Because really, sex for grades are two people implicated from the University of Ghana. We don't really get that sense of, of that. We'll come to sex for grades and job proper, that discussion. But first, let's look at the piece that came out from the BBC. What are your thoughts from it? A journalist yourself. Well, thank you, Vivian. Um, you know, some somebody at uh, one newspaper says, "Well, we should reject it." Yeah, this um, is BBC. I, I would um, say that chronicle. we should. I wouldn't say that we should reject it. Really, uh, you know, <laughs> the BBC is not is not seeking our acceptance um, of of their work to validate what they've done. So rejection. But I think we can ignore it. You think so? Uh, yeah, we can ignore the work. Mm. It is, you know, they should do what they want to do, and we do what we want to do. Um, within the context of journalism, I, I, would, I would give them 10%. Oh, that low? Well, that's, that's being uh, uh, magnanimous. <laughs> I, I would, within the context of, okay. and I qualify it, within the context of journalism, I would give them 10%, because that's... That's a very poor journalism job. Um, it will pass for an investigative job, okay? Then you score high marks, say 90%. Uh, but within the context of journalism, in my estimation, and I can understand why BBC um, would do a thing like that, because I consider BBC uh, in Africa as a, as a dead brand a brand that is struggling for survival and using sensationalism to, to find some, some, some relevance. And so they will, they will latch on to anything that they get. 
and that's why they are doing things the way they are doing. Because the BBC that we have worked with over the last two decades, these are not the standards that we are, we are used to. That you have to plant somebody in somebody's life to, to prove a point. Um, these are things you leave for private investigators. But within journalism, let the person be caught doing it. Then you are doing journalism. Perhaps they found it difficult to get um, the girls to Do you find take it easy part? to do investigative stories in your newsroom? No, I don't. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that using a shortcut makes it any easier. And I'm saying that I, I've been asked to do an assessment of, of what happened, mm -hmm. and I'm giving you my fair assessment okay. that as an investigative piece, yes, it passes, it ticks all the boxes. But as a journalism piece, I think it's a no-no. It's a no-no. Poor job done by the BBC. Wow. And I say that, and I add that I understand why they would do it, because they are suffering. Because they are no more relevant in Africa like they used to be in the 70s and in the 80s when every African country was ruled by, by military people and we couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. And so we woke up in the morning and we had to tune into uh, uh, Daybreak Africa, uh, uh, Network Africa, Focus on Africa, to hear the things that we cannot say. Now come democracy and rule of law. We have found our voices. So BBC is no more relevant. Wow. Tell them strong words from some <laughs> men on the... <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I, I, when, when I heard the Sex for Grace documentary, I was expecting something a bit more explosive than I saw. Uh, the title of the documentary itself for me was misleading. Sex for Grace. I did not see that in there. What I saw was lecturers uh, passing inappropriate comments on, on, on support students, etc. It, it raises a bigger issue, I mean, of entrapment, putting somebody somewhere. And we, we are not even sure what the person said to their targets before their targets, you know, said those things they said. We, yeah. we don't know that. Uh, if it's a proper investigative journalism, journalism piece, you would expect that, uh, so for example, you could plant cameras in your offices or, or at places and pick videos and sounds of what goes on there. You can put those together for a news item or run analysis on it. But or you something. think they could have, I mean, gone around that and easily done that? No, so, 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 so this, is, this, that. Is, this is an investigative piece. Mm. I mean, it's just because the BBC screening it that makes people think that it's a, a journalism piece. So any investigator could do it, even an ass. Some of the things it does are investigative journalism work. Others are purely private investigative works. But because he's a journalist, you know, we assume that anything he produces is an investigative journalism piece. Yeah. So I think this does not derogate so much from some of the works of Anas, which were purely uh, private investigative pieces. So, yes, that certainly is my view. Um, I thought they could have done better. Of course, I've also heard arguments from people who say that it was going to be difficult for them to use students mm -hmm. for that because students yeah. were going to be victimized. Exactly. But the same way... We've seen others do investigative pieces, I mean, journalism pieces, where they've planted cameras and, and, and recorders at key places. Yeah, and they found signals. it difficult to do that as well in this yes. office. Yes, I mean, you, you can find it difficult to do, but that is why <laughs> it's, it's a job not for the faint-hearted. That is why you go all out to ensure that you, you, you get the, the, the details you, you wanted. But what it has also done, despite the challenges it has had is to, if you like, open the, the, the way for a lot of people to begin to have a conversation yeah. around um, some of these things which, I understand, have been happening, have been happening, you know, for years in our universities and in other places. Now people are beginning to talk, and now we are seeing uh, maybe actions by some of these institutions on what they want to do to forestall, you know, future occurrences. I'm not sure whether it can be, uh, it can be rooted out entirely, but at least it at will reduce. At least we started reduce, a conversation, you know, and let's reduce hope. the occurrence of it. So that is yeah. the only good thing I take from this. But to say this is an investi a, a journal, a, an investigative journalism piece, 
I, I think it, 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 it leaves a, a lot more to be desired. Now, interestingly, when this um, came out, uh, the um, chairperson for the Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee of the University of Ghana, Dr. Margaret Mwakohene, stated that, I'm reading from the same chronicle, that the committee finds no case of sex for grades in the documentary. She was reported to have told Star FM that, quote, Per the analysis of the video, there's no direct correlation between the lecturer's conduct and the allegations made by the video. The evidence does not point to sex for grade. When we talk of sex for grade, we didn't see much involvement of the lecturers of the University of Ghana. Our VC wrote to the BBC for their evidence. They declined and asked that we write to their legal department and we will do that. But um, a day or so later, there was a sharp turnaround and uh, the two gentlemen in question were I interdicted. What do you think led to this um, <laughs> well, well, decision first all, after first that? First of all, one? I think the interdiction is, is a step in the right direction because when findings are made, made against you, no matter how Superior sometimes it is proper in the eyes of the public to step aside so people know that you know justice is is being done and justice must be seen to be done so that investigations take place they give you a hearing and we come up with a conclusion or we come up with findings from that investigative or the committee which we investigate in it so the university of ghana i think you know upon seeing the documentary took a certain uh, view of it that one the people involved were not students. Number two, they did not see enough of sex for grades in the documentary. Maybe the documentary had been named separately or differently. It would have changed their, 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 their view a bit. But as it stands now, that's sex for grades. We did not see enough of that. In fact, what we saw was lecturers trying to use their influence to help uh, the, 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 the supposed students mm. to get admission or to do their national service or things like that. There was no really a mention of, uh, you know, assisting them to score high marks. There was nothing like yeah. that. So I think that was the initial view of the university. But given the public pressure and commentary on the matter, I think they realized that they had to look at the issue more deeply than they initially thought. So they said they have an anti-sexual harassment committee. Um, committee. I don't know how active that committee has been, but it appears that committee has been called into action. So we, we've seen that they, they have activated some uh, communication lines, some email addresses, etc., calling on people who have had such experiences or similar experiences with lecturers to speak up. And we've seen a few other people speaking up on social media and other places. You know, that, I think, is where the university wants to go. But their initial position that it didn't really uh, matter and that it was it had nothing to do with sex for grades partly may be true but that would be injurious to the larger image of the university yeah. if you are to sweep this under the carpet i think that is why they've resolved from that initial position a bit mm, i think with this we you skipped something mm -hmm. and i i read over and over what uh mrs samako mm -hmm. said she said that based on what we have seen, seen. Yeah. that was a reference point based on what we have seen we have no evidence of sex for grades. And that was not to say that the issues of sexual harassment or um, female students being disadvantaged um, will be swept under the carpet. Mm. And I think she was, she was very emphatic, uh, emphatic that. on that. And that has not changed. That position has not changed. Indeed, what they have called for now is not, they're not looking for students to corroborate the BBC story. Mm. They are looking for students who, in their, in their communication, have been victims mm -hmm. of. And again, it's not restricted to the two named lecturers. You, you understand? Yeah. So, as the BBC, uh, sorry, the U okay. University of Ghana, uh, thinking that, okay, this presents an opportunity for us to delve into this issue, put structure to it, and then be able to determine the way forward uh, because these things have been happening since since whenever mm. okay and it's not just going to stop because a certain bbc did something but we as an institution should put structures in place to be able to manage and keep these things and i think it's in the right direction even professor jampo was the first person to say that he agreed with the uh, he, he uh, thought it was fair and and i thought that was that was good on his part um, 
You see, this is what I, I see from this. Um, Jampo himself is now a victim of this situation, but he has been very civil or civilized in managing this, um, mm. his communication and his utterances, because he's a product of an academic institution. Yeah. And he believes that academic institutions run on reputation. That's right. And he believes that in his utterances, he should be, he should be uh, mindful of preserving the sanctity and the reputation of the university. So he thinks that, okay, interdiction is fine. At the end of the day, if I am cleared, I'm going back to the same university, and this is where I can apply my, 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 my career. And as a country, we also have to be concerned because, you know, I was just thinking, um, Daily Graphic or CTFM or Joy FM goes to the UK, does a story on some vice chancellor in some University of Loughborough, University of Oxford somewhere, and then gives it to the university that they should call people and start asking them questions. <laughs> uh, it sounds laughable, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and within the same week, we, we heard of some other lady accusing uh, the vice chancellor within yeah, the same, the African you know, kind of context. And I'm asking, where are we heading, you know, with, with the reputation of, of our premier university? And, and I am, I'm a bit concerned, um, thinking that in all these things, we should manage them well. We should manage these things well, because if we destroy the reputation of the University of Ghana, there are consequences too. There are consequences. Yeah. Now the university game has been become very competitive. Very, very competitive. And so if in the process we mismanage um, the, these things that are on the table, we are going to have to pay for it somehow. Okay. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll look at the real issue about sex for grades and sex for jobs, etc. And then um, we'll move to other um, um, topics for today. You're watching what the papers are saying. I'm with Samuel Atamensa and Salom Adonu. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Stay with us. Don't go away. Okay, so you're still watching what the papers are saying. My name is Vivian Kai. Look, I'm here with Samuel Atamensa and Stella Madonu. Thank you so much for staying with us. So let's quickly wrap up on the, the university proper, on this reputation. Obviously, it's been dented. How do they recover from this? I mean, what's the way for it for them? Well, I think they, they have. What, I think what the university is doing, in my estimation, is the right thing to do. Um, calling everybody to order. Uh, putting the uh, committee together, um, op opening the phone lines or the communication lines for um, people who believe they have been um, um, affected. Um, so I think it's a, it's a way to go. Um, but I'm, my caution was that going forward, this thing should be managed properly, considering the reputational uh, risk that is attached to uh, um, um, the university. Okay, so let's look about the uh, look at the story proper on the issues that have. I mean, or what? Because if you listen to Kiki, the one who did the documentary, she wanted also a conversation around the reality on the ground, which is a lot of women are going through a lot in terms of um, being at the workplace or grades, etc. There are some men who also claim they have been. Uh, uh, <laughs> harassed by women as well. Let me quickly read one that I thought was very interesting. This is from Elizabeth Ohini. She wrote uh, a piece on that. She says in 1952, she was seven years old, uh, was in class three, and was living in Abutia with her grandmother. I hope I'm getting it right. There was a celebration marking the opening of a bridge near or in a village called Podoi, which meant the road was now open from Abutia to Juapong. I'm told there was a political figure that came to perform the inauguration to signify the formal opening, but I did not know about those things then. When we got back from the celebrations, a man dragged me into his room and defiled me. I don't remember what or anything that he said, but what I do remember 
is the smell of his body that has stayed with me to this day, 67 years after the event. Again, when I was 11 years old, I was raped. He was not a stranger. This is a reality on the ground. And then there are more stories from, you know, other prominent people on this. There, our very good friend, Alexander Aban, who is the deputy health minister, he's also saying that we shouldn't just look at the issue about women being harassed, but some of the lecturers, the women, you know, tempt them to do um, what they do. He's also written an interesting article when he was at Gimpa. A couple of ladies tried to trap him to get him to do those things. So it's a two-way affair. Both sides are going through a lot. But, you, you know, this um, story, when I was in school myself, I had friends who were actually harassed by lecturers. And the story goes on. I remember when I was going to the University of Ghana, I was warned by my sisters, do not go to see a lecturer alone. Don't go, you know, when you go to the class, sit at the back, you know, avoid the lecturer. So you were, you know, warned about the dangers and all that. How did we get to this point as a society and how can we deal with this moving forward? Well, um, we thank God you, you didn't have a personal experience. <laughs> no, I don't. Thank <laughs> <I'm> God. <laughs> Uh, how did we get here? That, that, that's quite a, a, a tough one. I, I think it has to do with the evolution of society and some level of acculturation. Uh, things we see uh, on TV, on internet, etc. And a certain moral decadence that is set into our society. I think it's a very big question to ask how we got here. Societies don't just uh, get to this point overnight. It, it takes a gradual process. That's why it's, it's an evolution mm. rather than a revolution. So it, it, it may not have started now. And indeed, these things didn't start now. They started decades ago. But our society and if you like, the predators or the people who perpetrate these things have become bolder mm -hmm. because society has not developed the culture of talking about it. We've not been able to shine the light on these dark spots. So they've felt more boldened to continue to do it and the more it's been done the more it's become a normal thing so the more their contemporaries or colleagues also try to engage in that and the more the victims also feel it, it's normal so it's not even important or necessary to report it and even after all if you report it nobody will trust nobody you nobody victimized, will believe you, you are judged. victimized and 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 you regret for even voicing it at all so so i think it's a sad reality of, of, of what happens on our campuses, our workplaces, even in the security agencies, etc. For me, what is important is that we have begun having a conversation about it. And, and universities themselves, like the University of Ghana, has activated lines for people to, to speak. I don't think that other universities should watch, should be watching this, you know, aloof. They should also activate such lines. If they don't have uh, the, the, the so-called anti sexual harassment codes mm -hmm. or committees, yeah. they should start setting up some of these committees. Indeed, it should cascade down to the secondary schools, the, the primary schools. GS should be taking a cue from this. We don't have to wait and say that these are university or polytechnic things. In fact, the Ministry of Education should ensure that each institution has something like that. It is crucial. It is critical. And we ensure that the composition of these committees maybe all female or maybe majority female <laughs> should ensure that when these things are reported to them decisive action is taken of course the action must be fair the the the, the so-called predators must be given a fair hearing and the victims must also be served justice that is why i i was surprised to hear or to read from people on social media blaming city fm and a why few we other interviewed media professor Jampo. for interviewing Professor Jampo, and I ask, we, we are not in a, in, in, in a jungle state. I mean, it, it's, you must give hearing to people. Yeah. So is it fine for me to just make an allegation against you and then be shut out entirely? No. I should be given a hearing. You should hear my side of the story. It is only after hearing my side of the story that you can come to a proper determination of the matter. Yes, so that is basically what I think. Okay. I think we must open it up. Every institution, workplaces, schools, must begin taking the subject of uh, sexual harassment more seriously. And you see, because we've, we've, we've or a lot of times, people have done things and, and gotten away with it, we pass comments which we feel are innocuous, but are, you know, are sexually suggestive. Not everybody will like it, but because it's become an accepted way yeah. of speaking, we think it's it okay. is normal. I think we have to get back to that and ensure that we open the lines 
we anonymize the line so that when somebody calls, the person wants his or her identity to be protected. We respect that and ensure that the right thing is done. Okay. We call the predator or the, the, the aggressor in this case and make them know that this allegation is made against you, possibly by this person. This is it. What do you say? We subject that to uh, the evidence given by the person, and then we see where the chips will fall. Okay. If the person has to be sanctioned, we do that. Decisive action must be taken to deter others from doing same. Mm. Well, I think um, what, where, what I find um, interesting is uh, the call to other institutions to take a cue from, from, from this, uh, not to wait until something explosive uh, occurs in their institutions, because really, um, there the, the are underground stories that we hear about most of the public universities and tertiary institutions, even the secondary schools. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about time for us to, 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 to institutionalize um, the measures that we are taking now so that it, it won't become a one-off activity. That way we are all assured that um, um, nobody will be disadvantaged, whether you are a, a man or a woman, um, you know, because people say, oh, and the men too, and the women <laughs> too. Uh, I, I think the, the, the gender is not the issue. Yeah. The issue is that nobody should be disadvantaged uh, in that manner. I think that's... Uh, okay. and, and, and talking about the, the documentary itself, I mean, the Unilag campus, I mean, senior staff club, and in the, the cold the, room. Yes. It, the, I mean, <laughs> it, it gets so bad that lecturers go to the cold room or the senior staff club with students, and nobody finds anything wrong with that. Mm. You know, it, it, it goes to speak about how we've, we've seen these things as normal. Teachers or lecturers take people to the so-called cold room, and nobody sees anything wrong with it. I think society must wake up. If we want to salvage, you know, anything at all. We must wake up and ensure that the systems are put in place to ensure that these excesses do, do not occur again. And, and some, some of the things it is well, very childish. And it, and, and it appears that for a lot of them, the lines they use are the same. And some of the stories we've heard about some of these people, <laughs> the lines are, are just the same. Quite embarrassing, if you which, ask. Which, which of the lines? <laughs> I'll, what I'll, I'll, the line. you, oh, I'll give you admission. I mean, I'll is, help no, you grow you, your career, you, you know, move you know, you for to... me, <laughs> watching the thing, I, I, you know, the Unilag man, I, I said, this guy is very daring, eh? <laughs> the first yeah, part. I mean, he, wanted, he wanted to lead the girl to Christ. <laughs> I, I wonder why he did that. <laughs> You know, <laughs> leading her to Christ? I wonder. You know what immediately came to mind? I don't know whether people still do this. You know when we're kids, when you're going to kill a fowl, you give the fowl water to drink. And then I went about relaxed and say, say this after me. <laughs> you know, he's a bad man. Very, bad man. Very bad man. <laughs> Go to punish <laughs> Okay. And it was confusing me at some point. So I don't, I don't, if you don't, I'll tell your mother, oh, okay, this one, your mother will not hear it. I mean, it's, it was so confusing. <laughs> so you're watching what the papers are saying. <laughs> My name is Vivian Kai. Look, I'm here with Samuel Tabensa and um, Salom Adonu. Let's go to um, our next topic. Uh, congratulations, anyways, uh, Salom. You, you are now oh, a fool. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm coming to the lawyers. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. I have no, to. He, he last escaped. week, he escaped. He escaped. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. He escaped. <laughs> <laughs> you escaped. But um, la um, this week, um, some of your friends, I'm sure, or I don't know whether some were your colleagues who've not, still not made it, hit the streets to, you know, force um, authorities to change um, some of the... Um, um, things we see in legal education. Now, there's a letter from um, the president to um, the chief justice about um, some demands the students had made earlier. This letter is in May. I'll just keep to the part where he um, sort of um, tells the CJ that uh, the, the students want certain things to be looked into. So... Um, one is on um, the inclusion of examination questions on subject areas outside the course outline provided to students. Two, the lack of availability of marking schemes and exam, examiner's reports. 
and the undue delay in the release of examination results, the lack of access of actual examination scores for students, the cost of remarking examination scripts, and a review of the Legal Profession Act 1960 to determine whether it is still effective almost 60 years after its enact enactment. And um, the president uh, um, employed the chief justice to look into the matter. But there have been a back and forth on um, the demands they are making, whether some should be even looked at and, and all that. From where you sit, you have gone through the mill. You have escaped, actually. Um, all the demands they are making, now you know the law, which ones are really you know, whether the president should get involved or leave it to the general legal counsel and all that. What's your initial thoughts on all these developments? Well, I, I think the demands of the students are, they, they are justifiable or they are justified demands. I find the position of the president, I mean, the, the president may be in a fix because you have the body called the general legal counsel, which administers legal education in this country. And the general legal counsel is headed by the chief justice. And the chief justice is supposed to be the head of the judiciary, which is also a separate arm of government. And we know this thing about separation of powers, even though doctrinaires feel it's, it's, it's not a watertight arrangement. But the same way we want to say that the executive shouldn't interfere in the judiciary and in the legislature. I mean, that same discussion yeah. is brought to bear on this. And the other thing is that the attorney general, who is the chief legal advisor to the government, is also a member of... The, uh, the General Legal Council. Mm -hmm. So it puts the president in a very interesting situation. The president may not be able to dictate to the General Legal Council. It's a body, it's a body created by statute. What the president can do is to influence the General Legal Council through the Attorney General. So this is what happened. After you know, um, an exam was written, a lot of students failed. You know, what percentage? Uh, Less than 9%, uh, you know, the I mean, last th one. Th this was the... A lot of you see when you talk about the, the 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 law school system in Ghana, a lot of things happen at the same time. So if mm -hmm. you're not careful, you Mix you up. jumble a lot of things. <laughs> so these guys talking now are graduates from the LLB or the faculties, okay. and they now want to enter the, the school. Ghana School of Law. And so there was this grand preparation towards a demonstration on seventh October, mm -hmm. and that demonstration was not only limited to just the LLB graduates but they expanded it to include everybody interested in legal education. Yeah. So there are colleagues of mine who were part of it. That's there right. are people in the Ghana School of Law now who were part of it. Indeed, the SRC president, when I was in school, was part of it. And I understand mm -hmm. he was one of the guys picked by yes, the police. Yes. So, so it was a mass of a lot of people, including people who passed and who yeah. didn't pass. Yeah, because Indeed, some of them, the regional uh, lady passed, leading yeah. the thing, I understand, has passed. Yes, she said But so. because she felt that her colleagues were not treated fairly. Yes. She, she decided to lead this and, and, and make their voices heard. So back to this. So the, the, the letter we, we've seen the president, I mean, addressed to the chief justice was when the SRC, uh, in my time, or after the, final, after the results came, met with the president to explain to him some of the, the concerns that the mm. students had. And the students actually asked him to set up a commission of inquiry to look into the failures. <coughs> Indeed, half of the class had to repeat the whole course. Half of the class had to repeat the whole course. And that, we felt, wasn't appropriate. So this meeting was, there are a number of things they sent to the president. Commission of Inquiry, which the pre president felt was not appropriate. They said that um, the remarking fee of 3,000 cities was they excessive. Want 500 so now. it should be reduced to somewhere, some, somewhere 500, 500 cities. They also said that the examination results should be released on time. For example, you write an exam in June, and your result comes in February. The I mean, between year. June, all the I mean, what, what have you been doing? <laughs> and the results come, and the result is composite. They put it together with your whole law school exams you've written. And if you fail more than two subjects, then you repeat the whole course. The whole course. It's as if you didn't even start the school at all. You may have yeah. had seven A's, ten courses. You may have had seven A's, but if you failed more than two, that is about three, you get to repeat. You repeat the everything. whole course. You pay fees. Wow. You attend. We do everything as if you did not attend the school again. A lot of people felt that wasn't fair. And also, there were some reforms. Initially, it was a, a two-year classroom work. It was reduced to one year. And the law regarding that hadn't been changed. So the law said that if you fail more than three subjects, you have to repeat the part, which meant that you repeat part one. 
or you repeat part two. It didn't say repeating the whole school. Okay. But because it was just one year, repeating the part now became repeating the whole year. The whole year. And we did not get clarity on that. And that led to a, a lot of issues. So th these were the matters sent to the, 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 president the, the presidency. The but the General Legal Council itself set up its own committee, chaired by uh, Justice Sufa Adinira. And what that committee did was to call for a remarking of some of the courses West, West students didn't do well, okay. about four courses or so. And when the remarking was done, a lot more students got to pass. So I think that was one good thing which came out from the agitations and, and, and all these kinds of things. But it appears a lot did not change with the president's letter because the students wanted an action taken before the call to the bar, which was just 4th October. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really see a lot of that. Yeah. And so it, it, it was quite embarrassing to see how things have degenerated. Students, you know, exercising their democratic or constitutional right to, to demonstrate, and the police pouncing on them in the, in the manner they did, spraying them with water, you know, uh, 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 dispersing them with rubber bullets, etc. It, it was terrible and it was shameful. And we don't think such a thing should be happening in 21st century Ghana. Some of us have heard the view that it's about time the system sat down to relook at the whole legal education system in the country. Somebody doesn't have to die before we set up to do something. People have been demonstrating. People have been speaking. You know, the GLC is a, it's a creation of law. We can look at the law and amend it to make sure that things happen. You know, between quality and quantity, I, I, I'm not sure... I mean, they are mutually exclusive. You can have quantity, but ensure that there is quality yes, as well. Quality. That, nobody's saying that, you know, call 2,000 lawyers to the bar in a year. No. You, there's a way you can balance the expectation of the public against your own standards. That is all what I think the, the, the students have been calling for. But it's, it, it appears difficult for the General Legal Council to yeah, see. But why, why, why do you think they are finding it so difficult to um, amend, amend this law to open it up a bit, but still maintain... The, the quality that, for example, the CGA has warned that she wouldn't um, compromise on as amends. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. You know, because I, I, I see this way that um, the CJ, I, I <laughs> you know, the Chief Justice is doing her work. And and I, I don't I don't think that um, she deserves all the insults that people are throwing at her on social media. There, there was a placard I saw. <laughs> you don't have to learn law on the internet. Okay, then give us data. data. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know she's doing what she has to do um, because of the nature of the profession. I mean that's how I look at it. I'm not a lawyer, so um, you know. Law everywhere, and that's why they refer to it as a noble profession. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not one of those academic courses. If we, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not one of those academic courses. So I can understand why they want to preserve the 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 the, the nobility, or is that, is that the correct way, <laughs> of um, by managing the numbers. I can understand. So that I'll give to the CJ and, and her team, you know, but. In every examination system, if you record a single ratio pass rate, then there's a problem with the system, no matter what. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. No matter what, what kind of examination you are running, if you are recording a single ratio pass rate, then there's a problem. There's a problem. 9%, 8% so pass rate, yeah. there's a problem... Either you have a problem with the nature of the questions or you have a problem with the quality of examiners or the quality of even marking or the quality of teaching, instruction. So, yes, the CJ and her team may have their position, but I don't think it's an either-or situation. Mm. You can have your position, but there's still a real reason why we should take a second look at the whole system from quality of instruction to, you know, and, and we also make <laughs> reference to the growing number of LLB education providers. Mm -hmm. 
that's also a point. Yeah. And some of them are of low quality. And that's a, that's a fact. You know, but even that said, we shouldn't be recording 7% and 8%. Well, that's, that, that, sh that shows a bigger problem than students who have failed. It also signifies weak instructions. That is, lecturers who don't deserve to be lecturers mm. who are teaching and being paid. Mm. I'm telling you, the world over, if you recall 7%, they will start auditing the lecturers. And then the schools itself, the faculties, to, to first of all, to be sure that they are who they say they are. I mean, how is it that only 7% will pass and we are happy mm. and all the lecturers and the faculties, as for the, 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 them, they are right and all the students are wrong. It, it, it can't work that it way. It doesn't make sense. So yes, they have the right to preserve, but 7% is too low. So, wow. so, the, the, so at, the, at, the, at the Friday event, she, she made a comment, the CJ made a comment that there's a committee which is working to, if you like, audit the, the LLB, the faculties, to see which ones are in good standing to see which ones deserve to be operating. I think the problem has been the, the, the weak collaboration, in my view, between the National Accreditation Board and the General Legal Council. If these two institutions are to collaborate properly, we will not have just anybody setting up a, a faculty of law, taking a lot of money from students uh, and purporting to train students in, 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 in the law. Okay. That should be worked on. Otherwise, we will keep having these huge numbers. Any corner you go there, say university there, you know, purporting to be teaching law mm. because yeah, but, it is attractive but, because but, but, it, it pay a lot of money. How, pursuing an LLB doesn't mean you want to become a lawyer. A lawyer yeah, but yeah. but the, the overwhelming um, the overwhelming feedback that we get from a lot of the people pursuing LLB is that they want to get to the ultimate destination of becoming lawyers. You know, some people may choose to have LLB for other things, but majority of them want to make want it to, to the Ghana lawyer. School of Law okay. where mm -hmm. they can take their professional course and become lawyers. Talking about marking and everything, like Samens mentioned, the problem, so with the reforms, the General Legal Council came up with the IEC, the Independent Examination mm -hmm. Committee. The Independent Examination Committee works like WIEC, you know, which I, I think the intention of the, the, the eight establishment is good. And it is that in the past, lecturers of the School of Law marked exam papers. They set the questions and marked it and graded students. With these same matters we are talking about today, people felt that if they offended some lecturers or lecturers didn't like them, there was a way they got them to fail. Mm. You know, sex for grace and all these things. Same Not thing. in so many mm. words. Things that were happening. So the General Legal Council again was petitioned to look into those matters. Okay. So their solution of the, or resolving the matter, their way of resolving those matters was to set up the independent examination committee which was responsible for setting the questions and getting the questions marked and graded. Mm -hmm. So they are not teachers. They will not teach you. Your lecturers will teach you, but your lecturers have no hand in the questions you answer, your grading, etc. But the problem, so, so that's a good solution. But the problem therein was that some of the markers were not lecturers. And you can't just go and take a practitioner to come and set a question for students to answer. It is a different thing teaching theory, and it's a different thing in practice. So, so they can set questions which are not really what students have been taught in class. So if you realize, one of the points um, the students made to the president, the way the president captured in his letter to the chief of staff was that questions came in courses which were not supposed to be in those courses. Okay, cool. So for example, you are planning to go and write maybe civil procedure, then a question from evidence comes. You are not prepared for, for evidence. That. But then, but, so but we, we have procedure. to blame the examiners and the, so, for all that as, is happening. So, but the General Legal Council is a mother body. Mm. The General Legal Council formed or established the IEC. Nobody knows the IEC. The IEC is, nobody knows them. Nobody knows who they are. And that is how the body is been structured. You don't know them, so you can't go to them. They can't influence anybody. Okay. Nobody can influence them kind of thing. So you just deal with your school and you deal with the General Legal Council if you have any problem. Okay. So that is the thing. If they can get maybe retired lecturers or they can get lecturers to set a lot of questions from a pool from which they will take them and get old, old le or retired lecturers to do the marking because they have some expertise in teaching and education. Maybe they are in there, but you that, don't that know. That would be good. But we, we, I mean, <laughs> yes, some of the people, we've, a lot of them are not lecturers and they have no 
academic experience. That is one of the problems. And then even the entrance exam. Okay. Somebody studied for three years, LLB, in some cases four years, depending on whether you're doing it a first degree or, or, or a first, second degree. Somebody studies for this long period of time, law, and writes 20 objective questions and two essay questions, and the person gets yeah, zero. zero. It's, it's 53 not, it's of the 1,822 people got and zero. the results on the board got zero. It's not possible. And, and that is strange. You couldn't get even one of the 20 MCQs correct. You couldn't write an introduction to an essay question to get the half mark or one mark. Okay. That is, is questionable and very curious. Okay, okay. So, as your final thoughts on this, and then we, we look at the no, no, how no. they were beaten by the police and all that. Oh, I mean, I mean, we, we don't need to discuss this. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't, you see, I've said time without number that the, the, the regime of policing in Ghana mm. is, is on test now. Because there are lots of things happening today that the police themselves would have to do an introspection and find out whether indeed they are well resourced. And I'm not talking about resources and equipment, mm -hmm. mental resource training, skills, and understanding of policing. Because 2019, mm -hmm. 2019, you don't go fighting students in this manner. They were, armed students. They were not armed and they were not coming to burn ben, no, anything doing, down. They you don't go shooting rubber bullets. I mean, can you imagine if one had strayed in somebody's eye? Hmm. And I'm asking, is that whoever was leading, was he, was he thinking right hmm. to order that they should be shot? Are you okay? So, so, so embarrassing. Yeah, yeah, embarrassing. embarrassing. No. The, the, the students had to run, run away from I their was police there. It was a pathetic uh, and seek you refuge know, you know, in the consulate of a foreign want to believe. It was. I, I was didn't there. want to believe that police would be using rubber bullets mm -hmm. on on Unarmed, you know, unarmed students. And they said the students were pelting stones. Where would the students true. get stones where, from, where from, from that the place? High, there's no way you could get Listen, any stone. It was up. just an excuse. Students can pelt stone. But in this case... No, <laughs> students can pelt bottles. But you cannot use rubber Usually bullets. To deal you see, that. The, the whole thing about usage of such equipment is normally informed by intelligence. Hmm. I'm hmm. telling you that for police to come armed in a particular... Uh, 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 manner, no, no. they may have picked up intelligence of certain things. That's normal for a professional police body. But you don't go shooting, you know, I mean, because they are, they, they want, they, they have gone to the right place, the presidency, and they want to demand something. You may not like their approach, and rightly so, you may not like it. But as a police service, you must always find a way to combat some of these things. Okay. And that way does not include using rubber bullets. Okay. And I think that those who did it, we should go after them and punish them. And you see that the IGP, <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I've, I've had praises for, 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 for this IGP when he was acting. Now he's been confirmed. L let's see a lot more of the action. I was saying the last time here that I liked how he, he started, I mean, dealing with the soft issues, etc. And even last week, we discussed a police here where the gentleman was beaten by some police in, in Kofrodia or so, mm -hmm, tortured mm -hmm. him. The, the guy that was last And the, the I, IGP then acting swiftly called for the interdiction mm -hmm. of these people. Let's see such action from him and not the statements they are issuing defending themselves. L let, let's see the IGP, you know, commenting on this matter, calling for a proper investigation into what led to the, the, the shooting or the, the dispersal of the students who were unarmed with rubber bullets and all the things they did. Very, very okay. shameful and very despicable. Okay. So people have been called. The final thing, we just have two minutes to discuss it. For um, those who are responsible for the collapse of certain banks, for government to take action. And this week, um, we saw um, four of ex-directors of the defunct Capital Bank, uh, two former um, MDs, uh, that's uh, Atu Asian and Fritz Gerald Donko, uh, being slapped with um, two, three or so charges, um, money laundering and stealing, etc. And there have been calls for government to take action. We need to see something. Where to go, Samen? Well, I think, um, of course, again, I, I don't have a full understanding of the issues, but um, this is what, what I see. I see the direction as going after 
those who committed certain, um, um, if you like, offenses. Um, you know, we, we still are not at the point of, okay, you have collapsed a bank. I don't think that's where we are. So you know, you notice that we, they haven't touched the directors or shareholders. Mm -hmm. They have come to those in charge of running the bank and dealt with practices which they consider stealing. Yeah. So, and, and I, I think that it's okay to do that at this point because, you know, um, what, again, my observation is that they've been careful not to um, scatter everything. It's like, what steps do we take to retrieve the money? And if you look at the the, uh, uh, the receiver's activities, been trying to receive monies owed the banks. Um, it, it, it's been going on for some time now, but time is also of the essence. And those who are deemed to have, quote and unquote, stolen uh, are now being chased. So I think that is it's early days yet because I think this is going to go the long haul. Yeah, pretty, pretty long haul. So long. Yes, I, 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 listened, I listened and watched um, Atuisian, founder of the bank, mm. um, on, on the on, Paul's on show. Paul's program. He, he was very eloquent. It's it's only fair that he's giving his day in court. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of things have been said. Now it is time for him to go to court and, and, and lay his cards on the table. So it, it's just good. People have called for mm -hmm. the criminal prosecution of these people. And I think the processes have started. Uh, we it's going to it's going to be it's going to travel very far. It's criminal matters don't end easily. So I'm just happy that they will have their time in court. We will all see what the issues are, and okay. then justice will be served in the end. The okay. taxpayers' money wouldn't have been thrown away for nothing. At least justice would have been served. Okay, let me take a few um, messages and we close. This is from Kafu. It says, quite clearly, BBC's work on grades for sex is below the standard when we match it with the standards set by some of our journalists here. Um, the sex for great stories are very true. It is happening mostly at the nursing training um, school. You have no idea what the ladies at the nursing training uh, school are going through. This is Joe from Legon. This one says, Madam Host, is it that we have too many lawyers in the country? The answer is no, because Yendi as a municipality has no single lawyer at the courtroom. Um, some others um, says uh, it is... A good trigger for the University of Ghana, unfortunately, to clear and repair its mess, its image, which have been dented somehow over time. It's unfortunate that such hard-working lecturers have been caught in this. And as Barton says, you can't judge a book with its cover. Hashtag sex for greatest junk and not factual relating to the title. Um, this one says, Samens, wow, this is from Vanessa. Vanessa, Nane Kia Oche. I don't know what she wanted to say. Anyway, we have to end it here. Gentlemen, thank you so much for um, joining us today. Samoa Tamens, I was City FM and City TV. And uh, Stella Madonu, also with City FM, City TV, head of features and articles. My name is Vivian Kai Loko. Thank you so much for your time. See you next time. Goodbye.